Hello and welcome to the Global Health Matters podcast. I'm your host, Gary Aslanian. In this episode, we'll be exploring the topic of water, sanitation, and hygiene. In this day and age, where we have more technological and scientific advances than ever before, there are still 1.8 billion people globally who do not have the basic luxury of running water at home. In addition, 3.4 billion people do not have access to sanitation. Not only are households affected, but so are health facilities. The lack of safe water and sanitation leads to the transmission of disease and the increase of antimicrobial resistance. In this episode, my guest and I will examine the health, economic, and social impact of inadequate water, sanitation, and hygiene. For this discussion, I'm joined by Annie Msosa, the advocacy advisor for WaterAid in Malawi. I'm also joined by David Wheeler, the executive director of the Ricketts Global Hygiene Institute in the United States. Hi, David. Hello, Annie. Welcome to the show. Hello, Gary. Uh, Great to be here. Hello, Gary. Thank you for having us. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to start by mentioning that I'll be using the term wash when I refer to water sanitation and hygiene. And this term is an umbrella term that covers many public health issues. So, Annie, I'm going to start with you. Uh, You are based in Malawi, uh, but you are also very active in global advocacy. How is WASH perceived as a health issue, both locally and internationally? So what you see is is generally you see that there is an acknowledgement that WASH is important and that it impacts on people's health. So when you look at issues to do with infections, I mean, even looking at, for example, during COVID-19, when we were all talking about washing hands. So there's that acknowledgement. And if you look at a lot of health um, strategies and documents, this is something that you will see mentioned as important for health. However, where you see gaps when it now comes to providing the financing uh, to make the services uh, available, that's where the biggest gap is, both locally and internationally. You really painted a picture of the actual effects that are very powerful. David, a recent UNICEF WHO report highlighted the need for a three to six fold increase in the current rates of progress if the SDG targets are to be achieved by 2030. What are the areas that need most attention? Watch is an incredibly challenging area to work in, not the least of which the reason is that, you know, hygiene is so difficult to build on and to create, you know, new habits and new behaviors. Hygiene is obviously a critical foundation for health. It promotes growth and well-being. It significantly reduces the economic, societal, and personal cost of illness. However, you know, RGHI has really invested in enhancing the research opportunities available in this space because we feel like the path through hygiene is the path to building better economic investment cases and building better measures of results for the investments in water, sanitation, and then, you know, the hygiene programs that then deliver on the promise of having access to water and sanitation. And Annie, in Malawi, how are the health of communities affected due to the inadequate wash? Do you have some stories you can share from your own experiences? Sure. I can speak to specific examples. Earlier this year, and some of you might have already heard, Malawi was struggling for many months with the cholera. And I live in a village and there was a space of three weeks where almost every day there was a funeral of somebody who had died from cholera. And the basic issue was, you know, not having access to safe water, communities not having the information that they need in terms of how they should take care of that water. 
And also later on, it became an issue of access to cholera vaccines as well, because there wasn't enough of it to be able to deliver to the communities and also to deliver it safely. And so you find that at household level, people die, children get diarrhea diseases, and they are affected because if you have young children in the early years and they're getting diarrhea because they are constantly eating food that is contaminated with fecal matter because they were not able to wash their hands with soap properly. Their gut is affected. They cannot absorb the nutrients they need to absorb. So even if you give them all the nutritious food they need, their body will not be able to draw out the nutrients in the same manner as somebody who has not been affected in that way. I have visited healthcare facilities in Malawi where the toilet is full where the water is not there all the time. And these are places where people come when they are sick. And they are coming there because it's meant to be a place of safety. But you find that the very places that are supposed to shelter them from disease become breeding grounds for disease. And women are forced to go and do their business in the bush because the facilities are not available. And women will sometimes even delay coming to the healthcare facility to give birth because they do not want to subject themselves to this environment where there isn't adequate water sanitation and hygiene. And all this has implications in terms of maternal mortality, in terms of you know, inf infections that women get, the length of stay that people spend in hospitals. And when you're looking at all this, there's a lot of money that governments are spending in response to the effects of this lack of wash. And our health system is constantly overburdened with disease and failing to cope. And a lot of it is coming from communities not having access to water sanitation and hygiene. And then when they come to the healthcare facilities, they are not also assured of a safe environment where they can be treated and go back home without having to adding another disease to the disease that they had come with when they came to the healthcare facility. Thanks for that, Annie, because you really painted a picture of the actual effects that was very powerful. David, from what we just heard, I also read that in a recent UNICEF WHO report highlighting the need for three to six fold increase in progress if the WASH SDG targets are to be achieved by 2030. What are the areas that need to be having more action? I think the investments necessary to bring water sanitation and hygiene up to slopes, you know, into a position where they can meet the SDG goals is going to require a lot of investment across the board. One of the challenges are looking at how the investments improve people's well-being and looking at how best to solve the challenges and and make sure we're investing in the next best uh the next best investment in terms of of moving from we have clean water and then are we getting the clean water into the healthcare facilities are we getting clean water into the villages and looking at how we're you know providing sanitation facilities but then are those sanitation facilities being emptied and you know this kind of comes under the category of system strengthening and you know, RGHI is, is working closely with uh, a couple of teams to better understand how system strengthening, what system strengthening means to hygiene. But I think in general, system strengthening is a focus and we need to understand how to create investments that make the whole system work so that the hygiene interventions that are working towards preventing mothers from transmitting diarrheal disease during weaning, which is a, a, a research project we're working on in, in Bangladesh, or we've funded in Bangladesh. We want all of those interventions to be able to work within a system that's supporting the local communities and supporting the healthcare facilities so that they can achieve the health outcomes and the promises of WASH investment. Annie, what are your ideas about this in terms of how we can get to the uh, targets we have? It depends on how, how you're looking at the issue, because at the moment it can look like, oh, this is taking a lot of money for us to get there. But then how much money are we losing right now because we're not taking any action? So I think that there's need to look at this problem differently and to be able to determine what mm -hmm. is the investment that we need to make now that is going to save us a lot of lives, that is going to save us a lot of money that we're going to spend having to treat diseases that we would have prevented in the first place. So, for example, just looking at some of the problems like washing healthcare facilities, for 
countries that are most affected that have low incomes, all that's needed is 9.6 billion over the next eight years. Now, when you look at it, that's 60 cents per person per year. And then when you look at the saving that that will bring, I mean, every dollar is will bring back in terms of returns on investment of $16. Now, if you look at that, and that's one of the strongest returns on investment on health. And it has impact across so many different issues. So I think that there's, there's also the need to look at this problem differently and look at what we're losing. And therefore, when we look at what needs to be spent, it will no longer look like a huge amount because we are already paying for the lack of wash. We are already spending because of the lack of wash. And it's just a question of us making the choice of what do we want to spend on? Do we want to spend on perpetually treating the symptoms of the lack of wash? Or do we want to invest in sustainable wash that is going to make sure that those symptoms, they go away forever and therefore we no longer have to continue spending? Whichever choice we make, we are spending and we are spending a lot of money because of the lack of wash. We just need to make a choice on which one is most important. And I would say, let's spend on the prevention and that will help us to save in the longer term, both in terms of lives, but also economically, we can use that money to invest in other things, you know, that bring positive benefits to our lives. Mm -hmm. So... Just another highlight as well, um, and we'll come back to this financing issue shortly, uh, Annie, but uh, you already touched upon the gender aspect of uh, WASH, and the same report I just quoted says that seven out of 10 girls are responsible for fetching water daily. What are the impacts of this inadequate drinking water sanitation on women? I would say this, the impacts are huge huge first in the sense of just the sheer millions i think is it 77 million days that women are losing just because of time spent going to fetch water and it's mm. girls and it's women and and we have lived it and in 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 countries like malawi it's not even just girls it's everyone i have to go fetch water because my water supply is not is not always there so just the sheer amount of time that is spent by women and girls is a huge impact on their livelihoods and also even the free time for them to be productive and even their mental health as well. Now, I want to paint a picture of a pregnant woman, right? Like if there is no access to sanitation, right? She doesn't have access to a toilet. This can result in worm infestations and this will lead to anemia while she is pregnant and that will affect both her health but also the health of her unborn child. If she has to go for kilometers to go fetch water while she's pregnant, that has got a physical impact on her body, right? It can cause life-threatening disabilities. It can cause spinal injuries, hernias, genital prolapse, and it can also increase, you know, cases of spontaneous abortion to pregnant women. Let's also recognize that a lot of times it is people that are living in poverty that also do not have access to water sanitation and hygiene, which means they're not just suffering from the lack of water. They also do not have adequate food. They also have other issues. And therefore, this woman who already does not have adequate nutrition or struggling to get that has to spend a lot of energy walking. And therefore, her health and the health of her child is also affected. And then if I go to the hospital, I already talked about what happens within that space. If I am giving birth, you know, in some countries, they will give women antibiotics before they are even sick because they are anticipating that they will get infections. And that is just a sign to show that there is a recognition that there is an issue. This is not a safe place and we need to make it safe, but the action is not happening. So that also has an effect even in terms of antibiotic resistance. You're prescribing antibiotics before people have even gotten sick and that also affects the health of women and the other side of this is also healthcare workers you know nurses midwives uh, community healthcare workers these are at the front line of the health service 90 percent of frontline healthcare workers are women and what does this mean it means that they're significantly 
exposed to this issue. They cannot do their job properly. And, you know, it's, it's a frustrating thing. It brings mental health issues because you want to help, but people are dying because you did not have all the tools, the basic tools that you need for you to deliver a quality service to your patients. And I have visited healthcare facilities um, earlier this year in, in Chisi, and I was talking to a nurse and this particular healthcare facility, Water Aid, had provided some improvements in terms of water sanitation and hygiene, but also, you know, done some behavior change, promotion and training. And you could see the pride of the healthcare workers just for them to be able to say, this place is clean now. And the nurses were actually saying, we no longer have sepsis cases here. The cases that are, uh, are finding us are now coming from the community. And you could see the sheer sense of relief. And you can also see the impact that that must have had on their mental health when instead of delivering safely, babies were getting sick because the situation was just not, not clean because there wasn't enough water sanitation and hygiene or the practices around infection prevention were not up to standard. Thanks, Annie. David, I know you've mentioned some of the research that you supported with the focus on impact of WASH on women. Do you have an example how some of the countries have dealt with this as well through your work? We've funded several research programs that are really focused in on um, the impact of hygiene in women. The first one I mentioned earlier was this uh, study that we funded in Bangladesh looking at women who are uh, going through the weaning process and make porridge in the morning. And then, you know, teaching them that they need to reheat the porridge uh, during the day so that it doesn't become contaminated, you know, with bacteria during the course of the day, and then result in diarrheal disease infection in their children during this really important time around weaning. We have work going on in, in Bangladesh and in several other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. We think it's really important to better understand the menstrual practices through the uh, the menstrual practices needs scale, which has been deployed by one of our fellows, uh, Julie Hennigan, and using that data to then really understand both how we could improve those practices or bring better solutions to those populations, and also understand its impacts on educational attainment, on uh, general well-being, mental health, you know, all the other ways that um, good hygiene practices can improve people's lives and, pe and, and the outcomes of populations. In addition, you know, the challenges around birthing suites and cleanliness and, and hygiene, you know, um, teaching that kind of habit and behavior change, looking at those systems and making sure the nurses in those facilities are supported by all of the different elements that are necessary to maintain and codify those habits is something that we're really interested in. And we've built in significant weighting into our calls for research so that looking into women's health, looking into inequity gaps, better understanding how the systems are supporting good improvements and making sure those improvements in hygiene last is, is something that's really important for us because we think it's the ability for a small group in Malawi who has a, a hygienic delivery room to then transfer those habits to other hospitals and have other hospitals support that intervention and maintain that intervention over the long term that's going to improve health in a measurable way. Annie, do you have other strategies that you could share that uh, maybe from your experience in Malawi that target women that has improved WASH? So Water Aid has been doing a lot of work around hygiene promotion, both within the community and in um, in healthcare facilities. Uh, and some of those interventions have focused on, you know, maternal health. Some of those interventions have been linked with nutrition um, in different communities. There's different elements to this. The first one is really investing in understanding the needs of the women. What is it that they need when they come to the healthcare facilities? What are the gaps that they're seeing when they're within their communities? So that they are really part of the process in terms of making decisions around what services are needed, but also what role they can play in ensuring that those things happen. So we have been working with women groups, you know, women that are promoting self-motherhood. We have been working with citizens forums that also include women. We have been working with girls groups in schools, you know, to try and promote their agency 
to change the issues, but also to ensure that they are part of the process and they're also part of the process in terms of sustainability of whatever services are being provided and they can be able to hold duty bearers to account. And as a result of this, we have seen a lot of changes like in terms of, first of all, the designs and how they take care of the different, you know, needs of the women, the cultural dynamics around things like what happens to a placenta and whether or not a woman is comfortable for that to be disposed of at the healthcare facility. We've seen a lot of targeting around what happens around the healthcare facilities I was talking about earlier, working with cleaners, working with nurses, working with midwives to make sure that they become champions. And so there's been a lot of behavior change campaigns, working with communities and creating champions um, and also kind Kind of increasing standards around what hygiene should be expected at a healthcare facility and making communities aware of the sort of standard that should be there and also supporting them to engage with like the offices of the ombudsman when things are not going all right or to even be able to meet with the hospital management when they're seeing, seeing that the wash situation is not going the way that it should. And we've seen a lot of positive results. Uh, we've seen increased uptake of services in some of the healthcare facilities. We've seen even in reduced infections, healthcare facilities reporting that the infection rates have reduced. And we've seen an increased uptake of women coming to the healthcare facilities to access services and doing that earlier. So involving them right through the process and make, treating them as experts in their own needs and also making sure that they are part of their taking part in everything and their needs are being met in whatever designs are there is really, really critical and also promoting their agency so that when NGOs are not there, when they're dealing with the government, they know what they need to do. They know who they need to engage and they're aware of their power and they're part of the decision making around what happens. And it brings a sense of pride when things change within the community in that way. Quickly going back to this issue of financing and WASH, and you brought up earlier, David, uh, what evidence is available that supports a case for investment in WASH activities? Annie has made a good case for, you know, in the reported literature, uh, there's there's lots of evidence that, you know, investing in hygiene, investing in these WASH interventions have reasonable paybacks and reasonable payback periods. We spend a lot of money trying to determine the health impacts and disease burdens that are alleviated through WASH investment. And to some extent, maybe we need to move away from a direct sort of dollar value cost benefit analysis and look at something more along quality or quality of life measures. And this is an area that RGHI is actually actively investing in and looking at how do we better measure the impacts of WASH investment through the adoption of hygiene habits or better health outcomes, but not necessarily driving those all the way to a dollar value. And in doing so, I think we can better engage with the government and agency partners that are involved in many of these projects, but also looking at how to make the science more accessible and use the data that's being collected by aid organizations like WaterAid it at the local level and get that into the conversation around we have lots of evidence being generated at the local level that isn't getting into the policy discussion and isn't influencing uh, investment decisions in the way it should. So how our GHI can create um, better forms or better platforms for gathering that data, improving the collection and dissemination of that data in order to support you know, maybe a less economically rigorous uh, investment case, but a more uh, well supported with wealth of data and localized data and looking at scalability and practical implementation more than just straight dollar values. Annie, you have mentioned to me before we recorded this episode that WASH is not viewed as a critical health investment area by the global health community sometimes. Could you tell us more about how this plays out at a country level? So the health investment, you know, tends to be disease focused and WASH is not a disease, even though it impacts on so many diseases. There's even evidence, like there was a Lancet report that talked about the global burden of disease and diarrheal diseases were listed as among the top five contributing towards disability adjusted life years. Now, one would expect that for something in the top five, it should also be top five in terms of 
you know, getting the money. But you find that that does not happen. And what I did a research and we talked to different donors that are providing funding for uh, for health. And you find that, for example, the issue of washing healthcare facilities, they don't even track it. They don't even know how much money they're giving towards this issue to begin with. At the same time, some of the donors would say, you know, there's a focus on, we want you to tell us a direct link to the disease that if you do this, you're going to avert this many deaths. But it's interesting that in 2019, 1.4 million people died as a result of lack of wash. And this is a WHO report, right? That's looking at the burden of disease from wash. And then one wonders in terms of, is that not a strong enough link to warrant investment? Some donors say, no, wash is a technical issue. And therefore, it's not something that they look at, that it needs the political attention and and drive to really prioritize it and make sure that it is being funded. So how this results at country level is sometimes you will find that even where WASH has been put in programs, like, for example, you have WASH in the AMR National Action Plan in Malawi. But when you look at the money that is coming, it is looking at surveillance for antimicrobial resistance. It's not addressing the WASH bit of the money. So you find that because of that lack of prioritization, you find that the, then the WASH doesn't get into the investment case or where it is in the investment case when they need to cut money you know th- that's among the first things that will go and not get the money so what happens then you you know the, the situation perpetuates where you still have um, lack of access to wash but th- the bigger issue of the focus on disease and not the focus on quality of care and resilient and strong health systems that we will be able to cope with whatever other issues will come as a result of climate and uh, and other bits so because wash is not a disease it tends to be dropped hmm. from health programs yeah I understand. David, you want uh, to add anything to this point? And he says it very well. The only thing I would add is, you know, we we're moving towards more and more market based models where, you know, we want sanitation systems and water systems to be able to issue bonds and raise money in commercial markets. And without building the habits and the, the long term sustainability of the utilization and of these, you know, of these infrastructure builds, and then building and having the community understand the value of this infrastructure and why it should be maintained and how it should be used long term, you know, it's going to be very difficult to get communities to fund the ongoing maintenance and the bond payments, you know, the tax burden associated with having access to water and access to sanitation delivered through these economic models. And so, you know, being able to create um, behavior change methods and interventions that, you know, result in long-term habit formation that give you 20-year timelines for fundraising mechanisms is really important if these more community-supported models are going to be able to show results 20 years from now. Hmm. It's hard to uh, believe or to think that in the this day and age we live in, uh, 2.2 billion people do not have access to safe drinking water. And 3.4 million people do not have access to safely manage sanitation. Both of you and Annie particularly previously described WASH as a little issue with potential for really big impact if we do it right. Thus, I have a final question to uh, you both. What recommendations would you have for global health audiences, those who listen to this podcast, on how they can think about WASH differently with greater solidarity. Annie, you first and then David. Okay, thanks, Gary. So just a just a small correction. Wash is not a little issue. There's a whole SDG around it. That means it's a big issue and an issue that needs to be tackled at the at the global level. So my first aspect is stop treating wash as a little issue because it is not. And that governments are spending on wash, like I said earlier. They are spending more right now on treating the effects of the lack of it, but we need them to spend more on actually sorting it out. So it's not acceptable that today half of the world's healthcare facilities do not have access to adequate hygiene. They cannot offer the safety that patients need, and they are not able to cope with the rising health crisis that the climate crisis is also bringing. Wash is fundamental to health. It is a no regret 
investment and the first line of defense against infectious diseases. It therefore is a critical for protecting health, both at home and in healthcare facilities. It should therefore be a critical part of health service delivery and be prioritized both in terms of programming and funding. Without this, we will continue to lose money. At the moment, healthcare acquired infections are 20 times higher in developing countries than in the developed world. And yet 70% of these can be averted just by improving water sanitation and hygiene and infection prevention practices. We need to do health service differently. We need to focus on prevention and we need to focus on quality and safe healthcare service. WASH is at the foundation of that. We can no longer allow healthcare facilities to continue to operate without water sanitation and hygiene. We can no longer allow communities to continue to suffer because of the lack of water sanitation and hygiene. This is a big issue that governments and donors and the private sector need to come together and offer permanent solutions in our generation. Thank you. David? Again, an easy, comprehensive knowledge of the situation on the ground in Malawi and the general state of WASH in sub-Saharan Africa and LMIC is really shown by her answer. I think, you know, from the standpoint of a research funder, you know, what we're looking for is to build more collaboration across the NGOs, the charitable organizations, and the academic community to answer a lot of the questions that are coming up that seem to be roadblocks to implement programs or to to achieve, you know, better funding levels or to, you know, start programs and and, and secure additional funding for, you know, wall-based interventions. And that includes, you know, our investments in sort of in looking at, you know, how do we build a quality for hygiene or how do we build more measures in the hygiene field, like in the menstrual health practices index. But it also is, you know, bringing people together. We're putting on a global hygiene symposia where we're going to bring together academics and practitioners from a lot of different fields and a lot of different geographic areas to look at you know, those challenges on the ground and, and how can we mobilize academic research to answer some of those questions. If the donors want to know what specific pathogens we're working to prevent transmission of within these healthcare facilities, if we're trying to measure how many people don't go to the hospital because the healthcare facilities have, you know, significant uh, hospital acquired infection challenges, you know, how do we how do we put together the research programs that are going to answer these questions in a way that can allow us to build better hygiene habit adoption program, better health practices programs or health practices habits within communities such that we can achieve the promise of WASH, right? I mean, Annie's right in that, you know, 1.9 million people dying for lack of soap, for lack of uh, understanding, you know, food safe practices, for lack of, you know, access to um, reliable water and sanitation seems like a minimum standard that we should be working towards. And so in building our research program, we're really looking to help the program practitioners on the ground build bridges between the various constituencies in this space such that we can create integrated and complete pictures that are uh, really compelling investment cases for more programs you know, on the ground and in countries helping people achieve better lives through WASH and better health. David, Annie, thanks for joining me today and good luck with all of your work on this very important issue. Thank you very much, Gary, for the opportunity. Yes, thank you very, very much, Gary, and uh, good luck in the future, Annie. And you too. WASH is a big issue that requires government commitment and global solidarity if the Sustainable Development Goal 6 is to be achieved. It is not a sideline to healthcare delivery but it needs to be seen and supported as an integral component of it. Annie calls for a shift from disease-focused investments to investments that can avert disease. David believes that research and adequate data will aid in developing an economically sound investment case that can guide practical policy implementation. Before I finish today, let's hear from another one of our listeners. 
Hello, I am Professor Deborah Jackson, Takeda Chair in Global Child Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and co-director of the Center for Maternal, Adolescent, Reproductive and Child Health. I love listening to the Global Health Matters podcast. I have worked in global health for almost 30 years and as a busy academic, Global Health Matters helps me keep up with the latest discussions of the day. One of my hobbies is history, so I'm particularly excited about season three, which focuses on global health history. As I believe history, culture, and context are so key to the work we do in public health. So thank you, Gary, and all the team at Global Health Matters for your wonderful program. Deborah, thank you for your positive message. I am particularly pleased that you find listening to the podcast a way to keep up with pertinent developments in global health. And it's great to hear how much you enjoyed our recent episodes on history. To learn more about the topic discussed in this episode, visit our episode webpage where you will find additional readings, show notes, and translations. Don't forget to get in touch with us via social media, email, or by sharing a voice message with your reflections on this episode. Global Health Matters is produced by TDR, a research program based at the World Health Organization. Gary Aslanian is the host and the executive producer. Lindy Van Nieker, Maki Kitamura, and Obadiah George are content and technical producers. The podcast editing, dissemination, web, and social media designs are made possible through the work of Chris Coase, Elisabetta Adessi, Isabella Suder Dayao, and Cembe Collaborative. The goal of Global Health Matters is to produce a forum for sharing perspectives on key issues affecting global health. Send us your comments and suggestions by email or voice message to tdrpod at who.int and be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.